a Naval Academy graduate and, and a Marine, uh, I have to tell you that I have really been treated so well by anyone from the Army. <laughs> especially less than two months before the Army-Navy game. So I don't know whether I'm being lulled in so you can smack us down or what, but I am worried about Army-Navy this year. But you and the students and the teachers uh, with whom we've met today have really made me feel at home here, and, and I've enjoyed my time with all of you. Um, it's really what this day, this academy and these fine cadets are all about, creating an America that's strong enough, smart enough, and good enough to continue to lead the world and meet the challenge, uh, any challenge, foreign or domestic. It may not seem like it right now, but you cadets are the generation that will ensure that this nation lives up to its promise as a beacon of freedom, hope, and prosperity for our citizens and for the rest of the world. You are the ones who will build bridges of understanding and cooperation in the 21st century that are strong enough for Army, Navy, and the entire world to cross together. That's what I want to spend a few minutes talking with you about this morning. The incredible opportunity you have as students at this great academy to build lives of purpose and meaning for yourselves, for your families, and the communities as well as for our nation. I also want to let you know that as NASA launches itself into a new era of spaceflight and scientific discovery, there may be a place for you in America's growing aerospace industry if you prepare yourself well enough. I understand that your theme for this year is success as a journey. I can do this right. Uh, as I saw this morning in visits to several classes, that journey for you begins right here, right now. Uh, you may wonder why I picked this slide. Uh, it is, uh, this kind of shows the journey of the space shuttle program now that we're done um, if you look well, you, in the back, I know you can tell, but uh, we've got the beginning and the end of the space program, the shuttle program anyway, because it's Enterprise, uh, which was uh, the very first vehicle we ever flew, never went to space, but it was the key to the success of the space program because it was the vehicle that we flew what we call the approach and landing test. We dropped it off, off the top of the 747 to demonstrate that a that a glider that weighed 200,000 pounds could in fact uh, be guided to a safe landing on a runway somewhere. So that was the beginning. The next vehicle is Discovery, and we were doing a, a, a change there at the Smithsonian Udvahazi in outside of Washington, D.C. as Discovery was being brought to the Smithsonian and Enterprise was being prepared to go up to New York to the USS Intrepid. Uh, so that was the dedication day for, uh, for Discovery, and for all of us it was it was pretty special. Um, this is sort of a beginning and an end also. The, the crop picture on the left is John, uh, John Young on the left, Bob Crippen on the right. That was the crew of STS-1, the very first flight of the space shuttle. Uh, unique in its own way because it was the first time that we had ever flown a spacecraft, a human-rated spacecraft, without a test flight. You know, in the, in the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo era, we. We sent the capsules into orbit to make sure they were going to be okay. Uh, John and Crip got in this thing and we had never tested it before. So uh, we were just kind of hoping that everything was going to work. And then uh, what you see is the launch of the very last space shuttle mission with its four-person crew. Um, and that was uh, the final flight of, of Atlantis with uh, an, an all-veteran crew there. You know, uh, Hargrave is doing its part to prepare you for success with its commitment to building strong minds and strong bodies and helping you develop the character traits that are essential to effective leadership. And uh, when I was in Sergeant Major's classes, the leadership class with some of you this morning, we talked about leadership traits and character traits. So uh, I, I have a feel for what, you know, what it is that you're being taught about leadership and character. Let me tell you a little bit, though, about my own journey. Um, whenever I'm asked, what led me to pursue a career as a Marine, an astronaut, and uh, to accept the President's appointment as the Administrator of NASA. I think back to my days growing up in the segregated schools of Columbia, South Carolina. My mom, my father, my mother-in-law, and my father-in-law were all teachers. Uh, so education was a big deal in my family. Uh, I didn't have a choice about studying. When I got home, 
And before I left to go to school each day, my mom and dad reminded me of what was expected of me. And, and I was one of two boys, so my brother is four years younger than I am. And we were reminded every day that we were going to school to learn and to behave. And I think I didn't behave twice, and I learned to regret it both times. Because my father was also the one of the disciplinarians in my high school. So that was the last time I misbehaved in school. Um, I also wanted to follow in the footsteps of my dad and my uncles, men who had served with distinction in the Army during World War II. So I guess you could say my passion for education and public service is part of my DNA. In addition to the compassionate, loving guidance of my parents, uh, I'll never forget the lessons instilled in me by my teachers at Carver Elementary School, W.A. Perry Middle School, and C.A. Johnson High School. They, may, uh, they not only taught me the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic, they taught me the hard facts of life and impressed upon me that no matter the odds, I should stay in school and follow my dreams. I took that advice to heart and it has given me the strength to break barriers and achieve goals that were unthinkable for a Southern-born African-American 60 years ago. After high school, I fulfilled a childhood dream when I became a proud member of the Naval Academy's Brigade of Midshipmen in 1964. Little did I know when I left the Academy with a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Science in 1968 that it would lead me around the world, literally out of this world, and back again. I chose the Marine Corps out of the Naval Academy in 1968, and my journey from there has included service as a wartime naval aviator, a NASA astronaut, and now administrator of the world's premier space agency. And um, I was in one class this morning, and I can't remember whether it was, I think it was Mrs. Martin's class. Is Ms. Martin here, right? It Was it your class when, when one of your students asked me, what were my goals in life as a second lieutenant? Yes, sir. My answer pretty quickly was, I didn't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I really mean that. When I graduated from the Naval Academy and, and learned how to put on my Marine Corps uniform, uh, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. I knew that um, I had already violated one of the things that I said I insisted would be my future. When I left C.A. Johnson High School, I said two things I know. I will not be a Marine, and I will not fly airplanes. That's all I knew. <laughs> and so I had already violated the first of those two. I had become a Marine and graduated from the Naval Academy. So as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps, I was clueless. Uh, I thought I wanted to be an infantry officer, and so I set off to the basic school in Quantico, Virginia for the six-month course of instruction to learn how to be a rifle platoon commander, and, um, and the rest is history because I changed my mind. But I was able to change my mind because I had listened to my mom and dad, and I would studied really hard, I would worked really hard in class, and the other thing they taught me was never, ever, ever be afraid of failure. So, um, so I was able to take, take risks, uh, smart risks, I think, and do things that I never dreamed of doing before. You know, my journey, like yours, began uh, with an education that helped me expand my interest and knowledge about science, engineering, and aviation, while also nurturing my desire to be of service to my country. That's what you're getting here at Hargrave, where the emphasis is on educating the whole person through a combined concentration on academics, sports, community service, and leadership development. While I know that some of you students who leave here will go to major universities and some will go into the military, I'm, I'm especially impressed with your more than 30-year partnership with the United States Naval Academy Foundation. I understand that 99% of Hargrave, cadet, Hargrave cadets who pursue this one-year postgraduate program have received their appointments to the Naval Academy and are among the Academy's highest achievers. I am also impressed that this Academy's emphasis on science, technology, engineering, and math are STEM disciplines. As you know, STEM jobs and STEM workers are absolutely essential to America's technological leadership, national security, and economic growth in the 21st century. Uh, if you look at these images, what I try to portray for you is the fact that our new direction, NASA's new direction, uh, does in fact include a, uh, just a, a boom in the, in the development of uh, new technologies. Because there are things that, for example, things that President Obama has asked us to do. Put humans on an asteroid in 2025. Put humans on Mars in, in the 2030s. We can't do that right now. We just don't have all the technologies in place. And if we're going to do it, we're going to have to have people like you 
who are going to help us develop those technologies so we can go the last mile to achieve those goals. Uh, if you look at some of the things we're, we're dreaming about, to be quite honest, because we're not there all the way yet. In, in orbit fuel depots, and uh, so that we can refuel spacecraft once they leave Earth, so that they don't have to, you know, the, the spacecraft doesn't have to be full of fuel to make it so heavy that it's really hard to get it off Earth. Uh, thermal protection systems. Uh, I had an opportunity to talk with the, the spouse of, of the, the president of the Parents Association here, and he and I talked much of the night about thermal protection systems because he's actually built a business off, uh, off the thermal protection systems that, that we use for shuttle and other vehicles with NASA. So I, I was really excited to talk to him and find that we are doing something that people can use. I, I know we do, but it's, it's, you don't find somebody every day who, who can share with you the fact that there's something that we have that's related to what we're doing. Inhabitable, 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 and inflatable habitat concept. Um, there's a gentleman who lives out in Las Vegas, Nevada. He's a hotel uh, entrepreneur, a guy by the name of Bob Bigelow, Robert Bigelow. Uh, he has a dream of putting what he calls inflatable modules in space, around the moon, around Earth, around other places. And, and he actually has two modules that are on orbit right now that he sent to Earth, sent to space about five years ago on a Russian proton rocket to just demonstrate it could, it could be done. And we're on the process now of trying to seal an agreement with him where we're going to take one of his many modules and put it on the International Space Station, uh, expand it, and then measure data in it. How does it maintain air quality and the like? Because I think those are some of the things of the future that some of you are going to have an opportunity to, to work with. And then finally, solar electric propulsion uh, as a means for getting from here to there much faster than we do today. Because that's probably the biggest challenge for us getting humans to Mars safely is speed. Uh, it takes about eight months to get there now. And that's eight months of exposure to an extreme radiation environment that we don't fully understand. You know, I, um, I think, I hope we all know about the jobs crisis that's been plaguing our nation since the start of the Great Recession in 2007. But it is uh, a little known fact that while 12 million Americans are unemployed, more than half a million manufacturing jobs are unfilled today, right now, simply because the companies can't find enough trained scientists, engineers, and technicians to do the work. So these are some of the opportunities that you have if you're willing to study really hard, work hard, and get yourself technically prepared to go to work for some of these high-tech companies. All of this is occurring in a world where emerging economies are surging ahead and education has become the fault line between success and failure. Clearly, this is an American crisis, but it's one that we can solve. President Obama, who's my boss, uh, he, he repeatedly stresses to me and to, to all of us the importance of growing America's STEM workforce. And he's made it one of the highest priorities of his Council on Jobs and Competitiveness. The President has set a goal of recruiting, retaining, and graduating 10,000 engineers each year to maintain America's competitive edge. He specifically charged the Jobs Council with increasing the number of young people who not only start, but also stay with STEM studies in our schools and universities. And if I talk directly to you all, some of you know, I asked some of you this morning, what did you like about your math class? Or what did you like about your science class? And what didn't you like about them? And if I remember correctly, most of you who said you did not like it, you didn't like it because it was hard. Well, you bet. Life is hard. Uh, science and math are hard, but they're absolutely essential if you're going to get ahead. So, you know, I tell you, knuckle down, uh, stick with it, study it, and you can learn it. You can learn anything if you apply. Uh, from what I've learned this morning, uh, the, the counseling and mentoring that you have here, the availability of students, of, of your fellow students, but most importantly, faculty members to help you in the evenings when you go into your study period, if you want it, you can get it. So I would implore you to study really hard and work hard on setting your goals for when you leave, uh, when you leave Harvard. Um, as a government agency that's in the innovation business, we at NASA couldn't do the things we do without a strong and growing STEM workforce. That's why STEM education is the foundation of NASA's learning mission. At NASA, our needs for workers across aerospace in the coming decades will be great. The space program is soaring to new heights with new destinations on the horizon and new workers needed to advance aviation and space technology. 
A growing number of small and medium-sized private companies are also coming aboard as the commercial space industry picks up steam. Just last week, we saw the first successful contracted launch and berthing to the International Space Station by a private American company, SpaceX of Hawthorne, California. We've entered a new era in commercial space flight. More U.S. companies are getting into the game, and all of them will be the STEM-educated workforce. Uh, you can see here, I just give you uh, a couple, several examples of what the commercial industry is doing today. The SpaceX Dragon right there in the middle, that's uh, Elon Musk, a, a millionaire, billionaire maybe, uh, who is the founder of SpaceX and the, the dreamer who wants to put humans on Mars with his spacecraft. Uh, but he is the guy that designed the Dragon module that's on the International Space Station right now. We're actually standing next to his Dragon mod module that, that made the very first flight to the International Space Station was birthed and then made an intact, safe recovery and landing in the Pacific Ocean uh, just this past May. And that's the vehicle. And let me tell you, it, looked, it was in pretty good shape. And he intends to refly that very module. On the left is a different concept. It's a, a vehicle that sort of looks like a miniature show. It's um, built by a company, or being built by a company called Sierra Nevada out of uh, Louisville, um, Colorado, just outside of Denver. And uh, all of these vehicles are designed to carry seven crew members. So a lot more capacity than we used to have. Only uh, Dream Chaser and, and Dragon, however, are designed to be vehicles that return to Earth intact so they can bring humans in life. On the right is Orbital Sciences Corporation Cygnus module, built by an, uh, actually an Italian company in coordination with Orbital, uh, but it's a cargo vessel that we're trying to get ready to go fly and it will become the second vehicle that takes cargo to the International Space Station. Um, uh, you know, the good news for me is that everywhere I go, I, I meet young people like you, who are eager to enter the STEM field. So, as I prepare to close these formal remarks, I want to speak directly to you, the cadets, uh, here at, at Hargrave. Um, you know, the work we do at NASA every day is focused on revealing the unknown so that what we do and learn will benefit all humankind. And that's a passage out of our vision. NASA needs you to fulfill that vision. We need engineers to help us design the new rockets and capsules that will take us farther into the solar system than we've ever been. We need scientists and researchers to help us develop materials to withstand the stresses of deep space exploration, to sustain humans for long duration stays in space. And I mean long duration stays in space, not days, but months as we do today on the International Space Station when a crew goes and routinely spends six months on the International Space Station. But we're getting ready to put our first uh, one year increment up in a couple of years. And then a mission to Mars right now, you're talking about a three year mission, a uh, year to get there, almost, a uh, year on the surface, and then almost a year to come back. Um, as NASA takes its next great leap into deep space exploration, we're determined that American workers and American companies lead the way. That means you, again. NASA needs you, America needs you, you are the keys to growing our economy, strengthening our nation's competitive edge, and winning the future. But whatever field you choose to pursue, my wife Jackie and I have always given our children this advice. Dream big dreams. Do what you want to do. Don't listen to anybody who tells you you can't do something or you don't belong. Do your job and do it very well. Don't let the opportunity to make a difference in your world pass you by. Hargrave Cadets, this is your mission, and this is your moment. Go Tigers!